Hey, this is a match once again. We're about to end the video, and this is a paid request for Sean. Thank you so much for that. For those interested in requesting any type of videos, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. I'll get to it as soon as I can. And to be for any topic, review, commentary, re review, random piece of business like a trying a video game for an hour or a full video game playthrough or a tier list or re reviewing a movie or whatever the case, I'll get to it as soon as I can. I say PayPal is usually the best bet, but I do have a Patreon and a Cash app because people have asked about that. Those links are in the info box, wherever YouTube put it nowadays. And I will get to it as soon as I can. For those who sent it, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And this time, Sean, he sent in a decent amount of commentary, commentary requests. I'll get to them when I can. And one of them was for Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. And I have the subtitles on because it's so damn hot. And this way I'm not wearing them for the whole 90 minutes. And my ears are ready to swim the Panama Canal with how damn hot it is on here but I'm pausing at the beginning for those who want to follow along 3, 2, 1, pressing play and we got the Paramount logo of course Friday the 13th Part 7 The New Blood honestly I would say this is m my second favorite of the Friday the 13th films. I know that's a very weird choice. But I mean, Friday the 13th got into it in a weird way. My favorite one is the first one I saw. So yes, nostalgia plays a part in it, but I do love Jay-Z Goes to Hell for a variety of reasons. Which maybe, you know, maybe one day I'll get into that, but let's concentrate what we're seeing here. A recap of the first six, well, other than part five, the other sequels. Two there, we saw a little bit from four and six. And Walt Gorney is the guy narrating. Walt Gorney was the guy who played Crazy Ralph on Friday the 13th, part one and two. So it's very interesting they got him to come back to be the narrator. And I always like this recap. I think just because of Walt Gorney's voice, I thought they put a cool collection of clips from the various films. Got a bit of part four there. Which was definitely one of the more successful entries. And yeah, just the explosion of the, the tombstone. Which uh, part six, Jason lives. This is footage from that. And of course, we're going to see a chunk of that. So that was the, the last one, which is my third favorite. I know people don't like part six. But I just like, I liked the early Friday the 13th films, but the later ones were more my cup of tea. I don't know, maybe because I like the supernatural Jason more. It makes for some more fun creative kills. Like this, the, I love that, the face going through the wall, the indentation. C.J. Graham is playing Jason here. You got Tom Matthews. As Tommy Jarvis. Goodbye, you pussy. <laughs> Tom Matthews, of course, who was in Return of the Living Dead. He's been in a few Friday the 13th fan films, like Never Hiked Alone and Never Hiked Alone 2. Uh, part 6 I enjoyed. I thought it was well directed. I love the Alice Cooper song, He's Back. Tom Matthews, I thought, did a good job as Tommy Jarvis. He's my favorite version of Tommy Jarvis. I thought the kills, again, you have some creative kills. It had a good sense of humor. The little kids arguing. Not arguing, but talking about, well, what were you going to be when you grew up? <laughs> I, I like the sense of humor, and I, I thought it was a very entertaining entry. Now, parts of the New Blood I first saw on VHS tape. I mean, my introduction to Friday 13, it was Jason Goes to Hell on VHS. I think it was the unrated version. I'm like, man, this is so gory and you got nudity. And I mean, I saw that it was 1993. I love this bit with the light here. I thought that was a really cool way to open it, like this light, and then it's gonna crack open. The new blood. I like that title. 
I love the poster to this. I think the poster is fantastic. It's my favorite Friday the 13th poster with Jason on one side and Laura Parlinky on the other side. And she's got the white eye to show the supernatural she, element she has and the river of blood underneath with a knife in the middle. I thought that's easily one of my favorite posters of the 80s and 80s horror in particular. That poster is always striking to me. But yeah, I saw Jason Goes to Hell. And I like... Well, since the opening credits, I'll mention you, I liked the... Because I didn't know much of Friday the 13th, just the bare elements, how it broke lore, that didn't affect me, because I had not watched them. I didn't grow with them like other people did. So I watched it as an action film, like The Hidden. And I loved it. I loved the lead guy, John D. LeMay. I rooted for him. He was protecting his baby. The director tried to have these cool shots and elements and shooting the hell out of someone who's possessed and all this other stuff. Great gore, gore effects, crazy kills, fast pace. Tried to have a bit more style. And it does have a bit more style in terms of camera work and touches compared to uh, other films in the franchise. But is it a perfect film? No. I don't need some guy being shaved for some stupid reason. But I do like uh, the film quite a bit. In fact, the only Friday the 13th film I really disliked is Part 8. I do not like Part 8, which is funny because that's another commentary I got requested for. I'll probably do that after this one. But before I go on, of course, this is the young Tina. I think this girl, I could be wrong... I think this girl will later be in Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Master 3, I believe. I could be wrong on that, but I think this is the same girl. Again, I could be wrong on that, but I think it's the same girl. Jennifer Banco. Yeah, I think that's her. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I apologize. I get these things wrong a lot. Now, there's... Okay. We get the idea that she's telekinetic, and that was sort of the, the propulsion of this film being made. Of course, ever since, like, Scanners, even before they were Terry, I think Terry's really the comparison how do you have someone use telekinetic you stare I mean to be fair what else can you do as this thing is a rocking and a rolling now we see that she didn't mean to do it on purpose she was bad she couldn't control her powers and she's already distraught it's supposed to be a setup for the end of the film when he's supposed to look like some skeleton, but of course that wasn't the case. I'll get to that when we get to the end of <laughs> the film. And we have Laura Park Lincoln. Laura Park Lincoln, if I can pronounce her name correctly. Which I do like. I mean, she is one of my favorites. I think she does a very capable job as the lead here. And we have Susan Blue as the mom. Susan Blue, if you're a Transformers fan, if you're a fan of Transformers the cartoon, you'll know she's the voice of RC, the female pink Transformer robot in the Transformers cartoon. So Susan Blue did a lot of... I think she was a voice acting director in the 80s Ninja Turtles uh, cartoon, I believe. Because I do remember... A lot of times in the credits of the 80s Ninja Turtles cartoon, she would be like, I don't know what her voice director. I think the voice director, she was the dialogue director on the 87 TV series and the voice director in the 2003 TV series. Okay, so she worked on both. That's really cool. I didn't know she worked on both. Okay, voice director... 
and dialogue director. Hmm. So that's cool. She worked on both Ninja Turtles cartoons. <laughs> the ones that matter. So that's very cool. And of course we got Terry Kaiser. Bernie! From Weekend of Bernie's, which would be after this. So it's funny. He gets killed in this. He gets killed in that. They're both about dead guys. Different types of dead guys. And I would say his two most famous roles <laughs> is this and Weekend of Bernie's. One after the other. Here playing Dr. Cruz. But yeah, after Jason Goes to Hell, it was I would say it was the From Dust Till Dawn Friday the 13th Marathon that I found out more about Friday the 13th. Joe Bob Bridge hosted it on TNT. Monster Vision, I watched that when it debuted. I think like I I was enjoying Joe Bob Bridge. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, finally my chance to watch these Friday 13 films and Joe Bob Bridge is in the commercial breaks. So I remember taping it on a VHS tape. Now you find it on YouTube, but no one knew that would be a thing. Back, you know, back then no one knew that would be a thing. And just enjoying it. And granted, they were edited. There was the first one, the second one, the third one, then the fifth and the sixth. And then afterward, I would see them on VHS tape. Then DVD and so forth. Now again, the only one I really hate is the is the eighth one. Not grand, I say hate. Are there way worse sequels out there? Yes, I would rather watch Friday the Depart Eight compared to the Halloween trilogy that David Gordon Green did. I'd rather watch Friday the Depart Eight compared to Tizzy Chainsaw 2022. I'd rather watch Friday the Depart Eight. Compared to Etrus's Believer or Evil Dead Rise or Alien Romulus, I'd rather watch Friday the 13th Part 8 because there's elements I like. Jason punches someone's head off. The dark, Darkest Side of the Night song I like. The few bits he's in the city. There are elements I do like, but it is my least favorite of them all. Which I'll get to in that one. But I know it's a weird thing to say that this is your second favorite, but it is. Because this was the one of the most bloodless entries because the MPAA cut this to ribbons. So I'm watching as we're uh, the scene. Terry Tires are trying to get her to do some Terry shit. I mean, I thought these scenes were nicely done. I thought the actors did their jobs well, and it made it seem unique compared to the other Friday the 13th films. It wasn't just just people go to the woods and they need to work at the camp. So at least there's a little bit of something else going on here. It gave Larpar and Lincoln also a little bit of more of a identity compared to all the other characters in Friday the 13th films. Not just the telekinesis, but her backstory, being distraught, feeling guilt, having to overcome that. And plus it gives elements for different types of special effects, which I'm sure was another primary reason. Just Friday the 13th films since 1980, they were very successful. That's why they kept making them. It was a business. So yeah, Friday the 13th, 1, 2, 3, like they all made money. Part 4 they thought would be the final one, but it made a ton of money, so we gotta make more. The fifth one is like, well, we'll have a fake Jason, and maybe there'll be a running theme. It still made money, but people were pissed, so they're like, nope, we're not going to do that anymore. So we bring Jason back, part six. And you know, I made money. But even though they were making money, they weren't making a ton of money. And Paramount saw that a rival, Number on Elm Street, they were making a lot more money. I mean, Number on Elm Street 3 would make double what Friday 13 films would do. 
And in fact, before this film, they wanted to do Freddy vs. Jason. But New Line Cinema said no. Which, I mean, at the time, they're like, we don't need it. <laughs> Nightmare on Street 3 just came out, Game Busters, and then this year, 1988... This film, again, for its budget, it did make money. It made... Let me double check. It had a $2.8 million budget. And it still made... $19 million in the U.S. $19 million on an almost $3 million budget? Still pretty profitable. On the other side... Number three, four made forty nine million. Forty about fifty million dollars. So that's a that's a good chunk of change. And Elm Street four, funny enough, is my favorite Elm Street film. And that's why you saw that with this franchise, they wanted to be a bit more in that ballpark. So here, okay, we can't do Freddy vs. Jason. So, what can Jason fight? Jason versus Terry at the telekinetic. So, we did have more different types of special effects in there. You have the dream sequences that you have some action bits like the Dream Warriors fighting. What was happening? Dream Warriors fighting Jason. So, who can we have fight Jason? And they have powers as well. Well, we can't do dreams because that's Freddy's deal. So, let's have someone with telekinetic powers fight Jason. We're not going to have it a droop, so it could be a complete ripoff of Dream Warriors. So, let's have it be one person with superpowers. Yep. Uh, now we get the first good look of Kane Hodder as Jason. One of the reasons I love the film is I love the look of Jason in this. I think it's easily the best look. John Carl Beekler is the director of this, and I love the way he made Jason look. I love all the wounds... The spine showing from the back. I love the look of the mask. How you know the pieces are chopped up here. To show all the wounds he's gotten from the other movies. Even when the mask is off. I do like that look. Some people make fun of it. Call him fraud man. I like that look. I think it's a very. I'm like a demon type of look to him. And I thought it looked a lot better than part 8's pud face. Whatever you want to call it. Which we'll get to the 8th one. And Kane Hodder, he had worked with he had worked with John Carl Beekler on Prison, a Rennie Harlan film, where John Carl Beekler worked on special effects, and Kane Hodder was at the very end in this outfit to play the the main villain. And I thought uh, that number one, I like that film. I think that's a pretty underrated film, Prison. I thought it was a pretty good supernatural horror film. Got Vito Mortensen in it. Very early role from him. Has some fun special effects and energy. Which Rennie Harlan would later bring to Elm Street 4. But I like the way Kane Iyer plays Jason. Because he plays him like very pissed off. Very angry. Very, you know, turn and then go towards. Like you just, these little touches that I notice. As he kept playing the character. and Just his look. His build. His background and stunts. Made him a very effective Jason. Sally in a film that got the nuts neutered. Because the MPAA. Now to be fair. Well actually it's not fair. It all sucks. What the MPAA did. Nothing but what they did was fair. If you took that uncut version. And you put it out. People are not bad an eye. I mean look at stuff. Even in Thanksgiving with Eli Roth. Hell look at films like. Terrifier and like these other movies. And even you know. What they get away with. This would be nothing. And the fact of how hypocritical. The MPA does with things. They're so hypocritical. They're so full of it. Just like Hard Target. The NC-17 cut. If you put everything back, it would... It would be a probably a LiDAR. 
Uh, but it is again. There's a movie called This Film Is Not Yet Rated documentary that touches upon that stuff. Made many, many years ago. It's a whole ridiculous thing that could go on for 10 minutes about. Now, I don't know this actress's name. I can't remember her name. I was going to say, I do have a VHS version. Well, it looks like a VHS version. That's the gore put back in. Now, it looks rough like a VHS tape, which I guess doesn't bother me because, you know, Friday 13 films are not Blade Runner. They're not Alien. You know, they're not, you know, they're people in the woods getting killed. I'm fine with it looking a bit rough and tumble. It doesn't bother me. I don't think there was much cut out of that death scene. I could be wrong on that. But. Oh, you have uh, Jason. Oh, okay, so this guy here I should mention who's running away is William Butler. Yeah, I just love the look of this Jason. It's so intimidating. But yeah, William Butler is running. Now, William Butler, if that guy looks familiar, he will later be in the 1990 Night of the Living Dead remake. He would also be in Leatherface, the Texas, the Texas Chainsaw Master 3, as a guy going with the lead girl Kate Hodge, and they're both driving until they come across Leatherface and his cronies. I think this was a little bit extended, just a bit more, yeah, that was a bit extended. Him spitting up more blood, him holding the guy up a bit more, then pulling it back. So, that was a bit more extended. But again, anytime I watch this film, I watch the VHS, well, not here, because nobody has that version, so that wouldn't be fair. So, uh, you know, most people, you yeah, the theatrical version. But again, when I watch this on my own, when I say this is my second favorite version, I'm talking about the version I watch with the trailers and with the the other stuff in there. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I don't call it the, it has like 80s trailers in there. It's got all the footage put back in. That's the version I watch. And that version is my second favorite. Slice. Do you even make slice anymore? And beer. That's all it's called. Beer. Not Budweiser. Just beer. I guess slice was all they could afford. So beer just have beer. Is that Kentucky Fried Chicken on the right behind her? It is. It's the, it's the kernel. <laughs> so you got Slice and KFC. And just red, just beer. <laughs> probably stunt beer that costs a dollar. Yeah, KFC fried chicken. So that's weird. Like, uh, they could get the rice to KFC fried chicken. Unless, maybe, because they don't, they hide the words KFC. But, like, you can tell. You see the kernel's head. Oh, it's Diet Pepsi. See, see, yeah, I don't know how it works with uh, using this stuff. What you can and can't do. Now, of course, the guy who is with uh, Lark Parlington, that's Kevin Blair. 
but I think he was was Kevin Spurtis. I think that's the name he uh, went by in this. Be it Kevin Blair, which he did. Sorry, it's it's pretty late, so I apologize for yawning. He, I think he did some soap opera stuff. I can't remember anything else the guy did. I'm trying to think if he did anything I can remember. Not a whole lot I can remember, honestly. Hells of Ice Part 2, that's what I'm thinking of. Yes, right, he was in the West Raven Hells of Ice Part 2. Which also had a girl who was, well, I guess in that film she was psychic. Here she's telekinetic, so. The next film will be with Miss Cleo. Let me tell you a fortune of Miss Cleo. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Take that for what you will. And Laura Par Lincoln, I don't remember what else she did. I think she was in House 2, The Second Story, which I did like that film that came out before this. I think the same year she was in an episode of Freddy's Nightmares, the Freddy TV show, which is funny. She was in Freddy and Jason stuff in the same year. <laughs> and I mean, I do see why people mocked this film in terms of, you know, the the victims. They're maybe not the most filled with person. I mean, other than Laura Par Lincoln and Terry Kaiser. You know, the other people, I mean, I could deal with them. I think the, the one girl plays a good biatch. You know, the antagonistic lady of the, of the group. But, I mean, these other people, like even these two, it's like there's not really anything to them. Like, here's a guy with a machete, there's a girl. Like, there, there's really nothing to them. But, I mean, there's nothing bad about them to be either. It's just, eh. Just very one way or another type of thing. And when you take away the peace de la resistance, the gore. <clears throat> but I thought, you know, it just, I mean, it's sad that a lot of the gore was cut, but it does have a decent body count, like the number of people who die. You know, John Carl Beekler, he's not a master filmmaker. I mean, he's an effects guy first and foremost. He did films like Troll, which I'm not a fan of. Obviously, the two films I like the most of his is this one and Ghoulies 3. Ghoulies Go to College, which he did after this. He also did Watchers 4, Watchers Reborn with Mark Hamill, which I thought was utter garbage. But I know it's sadly John Carl Beekler passed away. That This was definitely cut. You saw a lot more of his hand through the guy. Like you did have a moment where you see him kind of doing this and then pull the arm out. And I see enough, so I get the ideas. Like, ooh, you know, punch a hole right through him. But you don't get time to linger, which is a shame. And, of course, you don't have the sleep in bed death, one of the most famous deaths. Which I do like it, because Teen Hotter and that Jason, you, it shows his power. It shows what you do with so much force. Now, in the uncut version, he whacked her like 20 times, but here it's once. I know a lot of people prefer the once. I like the idea that he kept whacking her to the point that the bed becomes a bloody mess. Something about that just felt very much more vicious. But this is still a, it's a very unique death. Whack. But granted, you see the continuum this day where all of a sudden there's a lot of blood on the sleeping bag because there's supposed to be a lot more blood. Now, like these characters here, like these four, I mean, there's not a whole lot to them. These five here, they're there. You know, they don't make me mad, they don't make me sad, they don't make me... Oh, I root for them. It's just, they're kind of there. They're... 
alright. As in, I could deal with them. I've seen a lot better. I've seen a lot worse. So, I, you know, I was like, oh, I'm fine with them. One way or another. I am fine to indifferent like, in that way. <laughs> if that makes sense. But she does play a good, uh, like, biatch. What was her name? Susan Jennifer Sullivan as Melissa. I think that's her. Let's see. Yeah, as Melissa, Susan Jennifer Sullivan. And also one of the actresses, the other ones, is Elizabeth Detain, who was in Silent Night Delaney Part 2. Another sequel. Now the stuff between Laura Part Lincoln and Kim Spurtas is kind of there. It's not the most exciting romance of the movie. I don't mind the actors. That, like, I like Laura Part Lincoln. Kim Spurtas is kind of there. He's kind of the... less. He's a less interesting like Christopher Reeve. Or, I don't know who else he would remind me of. Yeah, like, it's one of those guys that I, I'm i being lenient and saying I have to deal with. And I don't mind. I'm being lenient on that. But, I can see why his career didn't go a whole lot of a distance. But it's like, I could deal with them. It's like, you know what, harmless. But... Like I said, it's like, I don't mind the people in the film. I like the lead girl. It's a pretty short film, hour and 20 minutes. Doesn't always say it's welcome. The, the third act I thought really picks up is a really satisfying third act. I thought it has a really strong ending. Aside from one bit, which I'll get to, but it, I really like the ending. And I think the kills, like, there's a variety of different types of kills. And, like, the sleeping bag kill is really cool. Again, I have the uncut version. It, it may look crappy like VHS, but... As in, it looks like a VHS that's been seen... A, a dozen, two times. Dozen and two, too many times, but... Again... I just still watch I still enjoy in that fashion. And, I don't know, for this type of film, it doesn't bother me. Would I love to have seen a remastered version of it? Absolutely, of course. I might believe Valentine. But, they got the stuff there. The, the person who, the people who made it, kept it. Sadly, that was not the case for the new blood. It's too bad, I wish it was. Because I guarantee you, if you had the uncut version of this... And you cleaned it up, it would get a whole new appreciation. I guarantee it. I dare and fucking tee it because there'd be people who are, oh, whoa, what the fuck? You know, like seeing it for the first time, you know. <clears throat> Sally's not the case, though. As a shame, because John Carl Beatle had delivered the goods on that, and it's not his fault, the MPA. Screwed his movie over. He pretty much admitted that. The MPA screwed his movie over. What can you do? What can you do? And it's a shame. Oh yeah, we don't say. Sorry, I'm watching the scene now. In 1988 was a great year for sequels. Even like just horror film sequels. But you had this film, which I liked. Elm Street for the Dream Master, which is my favorite of the Elm Street films. Hellbound Hellraiser 2, which is my favorite of the Hellraiser films. Fright Night Part 2, which I enjoy. 
Ghoulies 2, which I think is fun. Critters 2, which is my favorite Critters. So yeah, Critters 2, Ghoulies 2, Friday Part 7, Elm Street 4, Hellraiser 2, Phantasm 2, which is my favorite Phantasm film. Halloween 4, which I think is one of the better sequels. Such a great year for sequels, man. For horror film sequels. It's crazy. And granted, you just see a lot of nostalgia because a lot of those sequels were not really that well received. I mean, this film was that well received. At least with critics and fans. Some fans like me do enjoy it, of course, but... A lot of people put more, you know, the first one, the fourth one, the second film, among others. You know, of course, films like Phantasm 2 were well received, but Friday Night 2 barely got a release. Well, I think these three do a good job in the scenes. They try to be very intense. Oh, there goes the TV. You on TV, Dwayne? One of those old ass TVs too. You're lucky she didn't throw a TV nowadays. Especially one that's bigger than your body. What knocked your ass right through the wall? But I mean, a lot of these films kind of have the similar fashion where characters don't know what's going on until the third act where they find out everyone is dying or everyone is pretty much dead. And then it's up to the one or two people to deal with Jason or fight Jason or survive from Jason and until the end of the movie. If it's not Jason, you know, the killer, I should say. No one knows what's going on Friday the 13th until they start figuring out people are missing. Then Adrian Kane fights the killer. Chops her head off. Friday per, you know, Part 2, no one knows what's going on until people are missing. And Amy St Steele and Paul find out people are dying. And Amy Steele fights Jason. And Paul is dead or not dead, depending on what theory you want to go with. And then fights the killer and end of the movie. Part three, they go to a farm. No one knows what's going on until people are missing. And then it's up to Dana Kimmel. And well, the one guy dies just his eye popped out. And Dana Kimmel fights Jason and end of the movie. <laughs> Keeps going and going. So maybe that's another one of the other many reasons why Jason goes to hell. It just felt so refreshing. It just. There you go, people say I don't like stuff doing different stuff. You don't like it because it's different. I like Jason Goes to Hell. I like West Train's New Nightmare. It's all subjective. This is my subjective. I like the way those films did it. Here's two more people going to die. If you, if, yeah, you do find these uncut scenes on YouTube, this is one of the best ones. What they call, John Carl Beat would call it the coochie face. Now, you, they cut everything about it out. You see absolutely nothing. But you see the guy fly back. And when he flies back, you see that he got cut right here. Like, this little bit is open up like that. And when he flies back, you see it's revealed. And then when she sees, I think there's a more of a close-up shot of it as well. And you see it in the face like, like this is cut, you know, a bit open. Really cool effect. John Carbito didn't work in the effects. But MPA cut it out. I don't, I mean, I think by this point the MPAA just a lot less tolerant of stuff. I think they probably got a lot of parents and a lot of people pissed at them. Because they allowed Gore in Part 1 and Part 4, among others, to come into fruition. And after Part 4 and the amount of Gore in that, among other movies, they got so tired of people bitching at them, the parents and all this other stuff, who they don't see these films. 
they don't give a rat's ass, they probably don't even parent their own kids. They said, we're going to start listening to them, we're going to be much more harder and harsher with ratings, so cut everything out. Well, we're not going to tell you specifically what to cut out, but yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of. You can come back to us ten times. We still not going to. We can't tell it specifically, because that'll be censorship. But I mean, this is the general idea. Then it's not censorship. I mean, what the fuck? Gobbly gook. Whatever your hook is. Remember that phones would have had cords on them. Nowadays, it's like, well, yeah, you have a phone, you'd go anywhere with it. Back then, it's like, nope, you need a cord. You go as far as that cord goes. Or you're out of luck, buddy. You're shit out of luck, pal. You ain't going anywhere then, friend. I think Kevin, the, the guy there who's the, the jock... I think, isn't he, I think he's gay in real life, and maybe he thought that was, he thought it was a bit weird playing this part, because he's supposed to be playing one thing, but he's really, a, you know, another orientation, I don't know if he knew he was at this point in his life, unless I'm doing I think it's unless I'm getting confused with uh, Elm Street 2. Well, actually, both could be the same, actually. Both could be the same thing. I mean, both could be correct. Yeah, he is openly uh, gay. Yeah. So, do it for him. At least he's not like, hey, yeah, I am, so now what? Not trying to punch you in the face with that. Look at me, look at me, I'm special. We all bleed the same way, as far as I know, so. Nothing wrong with who you want to bonk and kadunk kadunk. As long as you're a decent person, that's all that matters. So. And hey, if he found happiness, and he seems like a good guy, he was on that documentary on Crystal Lake Memories. So, it all worked out. Yeah, but this film, oh, there you go. Bernie, you found a dead body. So now I'm trying to think. So he finds this thing here, right? So when Tina, when uh, Laura Pern Lincoln saw that embedded earlier, is that her imagining it's there? But no, I thought it was the idea was like he took it. Yeah, right here. He took the thing. There it is, right there. So who put it there? Did Jason put it there? Was Jason's like, I killed him with this thing. I'm going to get another piece of the thing and put it in here and mess with you. Or, I'm trying to remember what the detail of that was. And of course you find out, you know, the doctor wants, this is part of his... Big old goal is not to fix her and make her better, but just more and more of this research. They probably did explain that damn thing, and they just uh, got easily confused about it. <laughs> RC is pissed, she's gonna stab you, Bernie. Watch out. Shove that rub your ass. I 
But Terry Tyler, you saw a dead body. What do you think? Like, you saw a dead body, so you know the guy didn't do it himself. Unless you seem to think she did it. Which, if, if you think she did it, I'd be like, okay, I don't want to mess with this girl anymore. So she doesn't kill me or turn me into a pretzel or stab me or whatever. So... I mean, the numbers are dwindling down. Of course, Terry Kaiser can't call the cops. Because he's the bad guy. He's a, he's a bad guy. Don't steal my car keys, bitch. Come back with them car keys. Come back! Get your ass back here! Don't drive away in your Pinto, where the hell that car is. Yeah, she visualizes her mom getting killed. Which, hell, that dream seems more violent than when it really happens, it seems. Damn women drivers. Of course, she crashed right in the damn ditch. We saw that car parked to the side of the road. She didn't bother to stop to see, like, who that person is and if they need help or anything. Nope. Screw that. I'm going to keep driving. Piss on that. Now there was a sequel to this film called Rose Blood. It's a fan film. I saw bits and pieces of it and I don't know. I didn't bother to watch the whole thing. I like the music, the song. The new blood. Like there's a song someone made for it and it plays at the end credits. I listened to the song, it's really good, but I don't know. The movie, the fan movie itself is just, and just in one location, an endless talk between Laura Parr Lincoln and, was it like a ghost version of Terry Tizer or something? And, I don't know, man. It just felt like it went forever. And, let's see, what was the story about on this? Thirteen months after the new blood, Tina is held and studied at the infamous Camp Crystal Lake Research Facility. You know that research facility that I don't know if we ever heard even existed? At least I never did. And I don't know. So I'm trying to see what the, the plot of this was. As we did this whole bit with our missing her earring. Um. I'm trying to see if someone that has like an actual plot for this. But to be fair, you know, these are reviews, so we're just talking about what they liked or hated. Having to sit through 63 minutes of movie without Jason was rough. Yeah, it's like over an hour before he appears. I do remember that, like flipping through, like, what the hell? Just a lot of, like, therapy sessions between T uh, Law Par LinkedIn and. I think it's Terry Kaiser, but I forget how he's back in the movie, and. I don't know. Yeah. 
yeah, I, I can't remember what the hell it was, but it didn't seem like something I would like. I do like that bit of Jason going, huh? who's there? Well, I know you there. I'll get your ass. I think even in the uncurved version, you don't really see much of anything of this death. I think it's pretty much the same. I think. Why do I think this was a death that was reshot or something? Maybe not. But yeah, I don't think you really see much added in the uncut version of this. Yeah, Jason knows. Jason knows she's there. Your ass is grass. Sorry, lady. You shall look. That ear, that ear wasn't worth it. Yeah, Dan, I don't think you saw much of anything with that. In retrospect, I think they could have done like know, the pitchfork and... Was it... What was that movie? Well, I guess to be, it was The Prowler, I think, did it already. I don't know, something else or something, I don't know. Unless it like hit her stomach and... I'm remembering incorrectly. I can't remember. I don't remember seeing a whole lot of them. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I missed it. But like I said, I do like the film. I can see why people aren't aren't big on it. Where again, when you don't have the door. It's kind of the, other than the Tina's telekinetic stuff and the look of Jay, like those aspects are really the aspects that stick out. The rest of it becomes as kind of a typical by the numbers. People who don't know much about the detail one by one and you're wondering why should you care? Because you don't know anything about them. They're just horny. They're screwing. And they're about to get screwed. <laughs> Like I said, the uncut, you know, version I have, you get to see fun kills without, you know, again, VHS quality, to be fair. But it's still, you know, you, she gets the thing in the eye, he gets his head crushed, and his death scene is one of the bigger ones in the uncut version, because he gets crushed, and then it's like, Slow mo, blood coming out of the mouth. He's squishing the head, blood out of the eyes. He like turns into like a peanut. I'm like, damn, why does this guy get the the worst death? <laughs> this poor guy. What did he do to deserve it? I would see the one guy being a little bit of a douche, like drinking the beer. <laughs> Give him more of the vicious death. What did this guy, poor guy, do? To deserve that. <clears throat> Try to remember, I think he does, yeah. Okay, you see a little bit of blood, but that went a lot further, where it's like slow-mo, up close, blood coming out of the eyes, come out of the mouth, took to a fake head. They cut a lot of that out for some reason. Well, MPAA, that's why. That was the some reason. I do like the little sound effect that... Boom, right here. <laughs> yeah that was cut a bit quick you do he puts his hand down you see a bit more of the effect you see him better in her eye it lasts seconds longer so but it was just like part 5 got cut down the shreds and was bloodless part 6 
I think the director realized, like, okay, the MPA is going to be a pain in the ass, so I'm going to, they're going to be blood, well, for the most part, bloodless, but creative. I did the face indentation, the guy being turned to a wishbone. Jay-Z does par punch someone's heart out. You know, throwing stuff that hits people in the head, like a ninja star type of thing. I forget what it was, he threw a screwdriver or something, so... Yeah. Bit more creative. And maybe, like, the sense of humor kind of helped the MPA kind of look at it in a different way, because... They, they do that sometimes. They look at stuff in a weird way. Like, you have the same movie and go, what's a parody? Don't you understand? Oh, okay. <laughs> Still the same stuff. <laughs> okay. I don't know. You never really hear about the MPA anymore. I can't remember, was it the house that Jap built? Was it they wanted NC-17? I can't remember the last thing the MPAA... Had a bud up their ass about. I can't remember. <clears throat> it's been so long. And here we go. Here's, you know, they find out people are missing or people are dying, and now they don't figure out, try to figure out what to do until they fight Jason and end of the movie. <laughs> so. I mean, I guess if I, if I ranked Friday the 13th films, I guess I would go with, again, my personal favorite to Down the Road. Ooh, a little bit of nudity. Well, there you go. Sorry, I had to stop for a minute. Damn. Brief. But still there. But, uh... Yes, it's called a flashlight. Usually it blinds you if you point it right at your eyes. No, that's a weird kind. Of... Why do you need a flashlight? I, you, look how bright it is. I just... It's brighter than this room. So what the hell do you need a flashlight for? It ain't even that damn dark. But like here, I wouldn't need a flashlight. Look how bright it is outside. Look how much light's going outside. What do you need a flashlight for? I do like that. That's pretty cool. The lightning. You see Jason in the corner. I think the first time I saw this, I didn't notice that. But yeah, if you watch that, when the lightning hits, right here in the corner is Jason looking at him. And when when the, the lightning's gone, it's pitch black again. But yeah, I thought that's a... I did, when I first saw it, I didn't notice it. See, I thought this death could have been a lot more. Like this guy, okay, he just stabs him in the stomach I just feel like a lot more could have been done with that it's like okay well I mean I guess to be fair well he, the one guy stabbed in the back I guess you know he hasn't stabbed someone in the front yet yeah he drowned someone he hit someone in the face um uh, Crush someone's head, boom in the eye. Yeah, I guess to be fair, again, he hasn't uh, stabbed someone in the stomach yet, so there you go. With a knife. Killer at Crystal Lake. Look at these newspaper clippings. Mass murder. You think at this point people would know about Crystal Lake considering how many people die? That'd be like national news. 
to a point that everybody would know about this. There's been so damn many. <laughs> you would think. But they never learn, do they? They never figure it out. Or very, very rarely. I should say, very rarely. But yeah, that fan film, Rose Blood. I remember like him flipping through it and going, what the fuck? I, I, yeah, I think Kevin Spurtis appears maybe at the end. I did Jason disappear to like over an hour and he didn't look that great. And I don't know, man. Like, why you would make a fan film of Jason and him not appear for over an hour makes no damn sense to me. Well, I guess other than being cheaper. I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, this guy gets in the neck and this is once again heavily cut. Because I think he gets in like, boom, like right, actually like right here. I mean, we got uh, 28 minutes left. That's with the end credits. So. Yeah, but at this point, I think for audiences, like I said, without the gore, even though you have, you know, again, very cool looking Jason here among other stuff, it just left too little. For the audience to desire. Because they've seen it so many times. There's been so many other slasher films. that have done so many other things. And again across the way. You have Nightmare on Elm Street. And you look at Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Came out the same year as this. And you look at. The personality of Freddy Krueger. You look at the imagination. I mean, from the different death scenes, you want to suck face, the person be turned to nothing, to the Roach Motel sequence, to the whole, your two, terrorists, your two characters stuck in a loop, and then realize it, and it was a stall for time, to you know, Alice and her whole arc. Even the dreams at the beginning with the how the dream warriors die, Kincaid and Joey. There's a lot of imagination in there and special effects and like a carnival ride of fun and horror. So you look at something like this in comparison it just looks very mundane to the to the audience. And then the next year, with part eight, they try to put some of those elements into it where the lead girl starts having these visions. Really enough, now we have a character seeing visions like she's having nightmares and people come out of the window and say, ah. I'm like, okay, I did it because you want to be, free. you want to be number on street, you want their money. Right that year, it didn't work for any horror sequel, because he had Halloween 5, Elm Street 5, Friday 8. They really work out for them. Yeah, even... 1980 was a great year for other movies, too. I mean, Creature Features, The Blob remake, one of my favorites. Sally Flot, but I love that film. Die Hard, Above the Law, Steven Seagal, Bloodsport, John Claude Van Damme. God, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, Rambo 3, which I love. 
And yeah, yeah, they did the whole jump steer with a tat. Which, how long was that tat in the damn closet? Like, whose tat is this? Like, whose tat is this? Whose tat does this belong to? To be stuck in that damn thing for so long. Like, who, whose tat... Who, who, who does that tat belong to? That... It was left here and left in a closet unattended and it's like, what the fuck, you know? Yeah, the cat's like, I know you don't die, I need to tile here and save the rest of my nine lives. Chris, that's always a question, like, how the hell do you not notice that? Oh yeah, throws it out the window. Maybe I'm thinking of her. She had an altar to death, I believe. Where... I think she got... Cut. Supposed to be like in half or something, but... You tell the effect wasn't that great because it was like cut. It's like one's here and the one side's over here. <laughs> but you tell it just wasn't the best. So this seemed like a better ending. I mean, better kill. Credit to the stump person who took that fall. Pretty good fall. But yeah, the 80s, there's just an incredible amount of slasher films out there. I mean... Picked a year, but Friday, Friday the Thirteenth films, of course, and you know the Maniac, Final Exam, My Bloody Valentine, April Fool's Day, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Hell Night, The Mutilator, Silent Stream, I mean, Silent Madness. Well, there's a Silent Stream as well, but some would say technically it was late 70s, but. Yeah, but well, here goes Susan Blue. Actually, they run away for a bit, that's right. Yeah, they run away for a bit. Because then he's a dick and puts her right in front of him to save his old sorry ass. Which I mean, of course, is the question, like, how do you, how does Jason catch up when you're all running and he's just walking? <laughs> I mean, that Friday the 13th game, I watched some people play, he teleports and shit, so he cheats. <sighs> Feels so bad for Susan Blue, because he seems like a nice person, and... She she wants to run, but this ass hat is holding her there. It's not like she stupidly stood there. The guy held her there. Such a dick. Sorry, I'm stretching my arm. Such a dick. Definitely deserves to die. But yeah, the, the, the just countless slasher films that come out of the, the, the 80s. Graduation Day and Nightmare Beach and... God, so many. And uh, some were good, some were not. Of course, it's all subjective. Well, what, you know, that's up to the viewer, is which was good and which was not. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah, I'm a face. Why? I mean, I get you're, you're blonde, but it's the fact that you think this guy's lying... Oh, 
But I mean, whatever. <laughs> Cause she's a dumbass and she's a bitch. That's but that's the answer. I mean, it's cool that that fan film, they got Laura Parn Lincoln, they got Terry Tizer, I mean, they got a lot of people back, but, again, they just have constant, like, seminar, I mean, psychiatric sessions. Like, people don't want to see that stuff over and over and over and over again without any of the, the Jason stuff. I don't know what they were thinking with that, I really don't. Like, what the hell, man? That's just me, though. Now, this is this def definitely got cut down with the, the MPAA because you don't see anything, but in the uncut version, you see he's hit in the stomach and guts spill out, which is very satisfying. But again, they cut a lot of that out for some stupid reason. I keep saying that because uh, we know the reason. MPAA, that's the reason. They suck. So I know the reason. I just... Eh. Silent one of those films that just... Uh, not much else we can do, man. We'll never, uh... Well, here you go. Push your ass down. And you saw, you definitely saw a lot more. Again, he would hit the stomach and you see guts spill out. And just completely took it all away. Man. Would have been nice to see that. Like I said, if that was in this... I think this would have a better reputation. I really do. Maybe not the grand all be all reputation, but... It would have a better reputation. You got the potatoes, you gotta have the meat. You, know, you gotta have the entree, you gotta have the main course. Kinda hurts when you don't have that, so. Kinda hurts a bit. <laughs> Just a bit. Jason just want to decorate the woods, I guess. Just for fun. I guess that shows you what happened to that girl. Cut right on the neck. You see a little bit of that makeup effect there when he's hanging upside down. Now you get to see a little bit of the Terry versus Jason bit here. Which I thought was cool that you had a little bit of uh, variety to have these kind of action little set pieces here that are littered throughout the, the finale of the film. Just gave a bit more of a seemingly bigger feel compared to other entries. Definitely give Jason a bit more uh, run for his money. Compared to other <laughs> other ones. No, Jason's not dead, of course. 
Won't be the last time he's been electrocuted. He'll be electrocuted again in part eight. And can our, I mean, what else can I say about Kane Hodder? Stuntman. I forget which movie it was. He did all the. He's done fire stunts in other films, but I forget what the. What. What project he was on where he got all the burns. That's a great jump through the window. Because you also have to jump, too. You have to jump through it and kind of like leapfrog into the window. A nice use of slow mo there. I love I don't know, I love the the way they did the eyes as well. And I do like at times, like, uh, there's certain shots where you don't see the eyes. It's just these black holes. And I'd probably say I actually prefer that with Jason, to just see these black holes and not see the eyes. To seeing the eyes, like, made some more human. Of course, he is a human, but just... When you don't see the eyes, almost as if behind the mask is this black void of death. Like that, the, those bits there, like you can't see the eyes, and I think those worked well. And Jay's like, what the hell's going on? Jesus Christ. <laughs> this bitch is on a minute pause again. Leave me alone. Get my ass hit. I don't know why, you, why she thinks Jason is dead. Like, she survived being electrocuted. You think a roof falls on him and you just dead? I mean, just very presumptuous. <laughs> very presumptuous to think that he's dead. Without any evidence. I said I do like this actress. He does play a good biatch. <laughs> Which you wait in the sea die. And you don't get your wish here. Goodbye, bitch. <laughs> Here's the act. Nice to gonna ask you a question. Surprise, Mofar. Goodbye. Good stonework to fall right over the, the TV there, head first. See, I like how pissed Jason is in this. Like, you get the feeling like he's huffing, he's puffing, he's like, I'm gonna get you pissing me off. Get you us over, you boy, come on. And yeah, and because you have a stunt man, like to be able to do these various stunts, you know, jumping through the window, the roof falling off on him, this whole stuff here. At least it was like a nice different way to fight Jason because you'd be like, well, we can't get too close because why doesn't, if you're too close to fight him, he could you just grab you and break your neck and rip your head off and all this other stuff. But because of her teletonic ability, she can fight from a distance and create, you know, this kind of back and forth friction without being. Well, I mean, you see the whole franchise is ridiculous, but not too. I don't know. Ooh, nice hit there. I remember that was the back of the VHS tape a lot, which was Jason. Grabbing the guy, 
and ready to throw them back and that was on the back of a lot of VHS tapes of the new blood I like this I uh, rip the mask and I like this look a lot of people make fun of this look I, I do like this look I do and it's a rotted face nose is pretty much off I, I like this preacher type of look to him I do I mean, by this point, he's not human anymore, really. Yeah, it's just a monster. Maybe just that's the thing. I like creature features. I like monsters. So Jason, like, like, being this like creature. I mean, looked alike, I should say. He he is human, but I just enticing bit to me. I don't know. Maybe because I like creature feature monster stuff. So the fact he looks like one met my approval. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Definitely some gangly ass teeth. Like, damn. Oh, yeah, I just love how pissed he is. Like, this really is, it was, I mean. Not saying never, but it was rare to see him like this, like pissed and stuff. I never understood why they never kept this look. I guess because every director wants their look of Jason. Because if people like it, then they'll they will get the credit. But like let's say if they use this look, oh well, yeah, the look is really great, really great. But it has nothing to do with the director because the director of the previous one helped create that thing so even though it worked for continuity but you know people you don't think they could do it better I guess if they fit with continuity then you would never have had this look although actually you would because of how I don't think you saw his face in part six like you see his torch, but then you know when he wakes up, I don't. You see his eye. This is a good fire stunt. Great fire stunt here. And of course, I love the bits of the nails going in his head. Like I said, I do like this finale. It's one of my favorite finales of a Friday the Thirteenth film. We have these like action little set pieces. I do think it's easily the best part of the movie. I said, if it's out there if you want to find it, the 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 uncut version. Again, it is a VHS quality, so it's not gonna look great. But I said, if you like VH quality stuff, VHS quality stuff, then yeah. I know this has a massive explosion, which every trailer, well, the trailer ended with this explosion. It's a massive one too. Look at that. You just feel the the explosion. You feel the damn impact of that. You really can. Like a powder keg. Now remember, I think this is... I think... This is one of the only Friday the 13th films whose trailers was narrated by Percy Rodriguez. I think this in part 8. Part 7, Part 8 had Percy Rodriguez narrating Friday 34 7, The New Blood. And Percy Rodriguez, if you don't know, this is one of the greatest film trailer narrators of all time. He did the trailer for Jaws. That's his voice you hear in Jaws, the, the movie trailer. A lot of other films. Just shoot. I mean, just keep shooting. There you go. Good boy. Keep shooting. Don't stop. Shoot him in the head. I was like, get that weak ass shit out of here. And yeah, I just love his look and I love just the pissed off attitude of it. Now, this was supposed to be more of a skeleton, like skeleton or like a 
you know, a, a rotten corpse. But I forget who it was. Someone who's like a producer said, no, he can't do it. So instead, it's the dad with a little bit of mud on his face. Why he doesn't look more rotted and stuff. Again, they shot one with the... Uh, they shot one with that makeup on it, but that producer, whoever didn't want to do it, told him no without giving a good explanation. Oh, he looked like a fraud or something. I don't know. Everyone looks like frauds, I guess. Because the frauds are gay. I've been told that, so. But, whatever. It would have made more sense the way John Carl Beekler did it, but, you know, just saying. And it was interesting if this does end with no sequel bait ending, which is interesting. I, I like that, though. Just like part four, you had Koi, like, okay, like, part one, it wasn't meant to be a sequel ending, but... The surprise jumper, you know, the kid jumps out. There's a boy out there, you know. Part two, where's Paul? Where's Paul? And, you know, the, the nightmare of Jason. Or was it a nightmare or whatever? The... Part three. I just say I didn't really have any for part three. Part four, young Tommy. It's funny they spelled Corey Feldman wrong. They spelled a C O R Y and they forgot the E. <laughs> but that's fine. Fuck Corey Feldman. He's a piece of shit. Why? I could go on for 15 minutes of why I feel Corey Feldman's a piece of shit, but. <laughs> eh, he. Uh, yeah. He's a piece of shit. It's a lying weirdo. Lied about oh well, Dominic Brazier was in Friday Night Part Five. The guy who died at the beginning, who had the chocolate. Corey Feldman's like, oh, I'm not friends with him anymore. Even though you knew what Dominic Brazier did to Corey Haim, you hired him in 2001 for a movie. That's why Corey Haim pushed you against the wall, asked you what the hell happened, what's the deal with this guy here. You shout him out in an album years later. You know what he did to Corey Haim, but you're like. Yeah, you wouldn't do all this stuff for Corey. I like, for shit guy. Whatever to get you some more money. Just people know you're a joke. Back then you were in some good movies, but now did you're a joke. But anyway, that's all other thing. But yeah, the Oh the see yeah, it was interesting there was no sequel bait ending. I think there was a bit filmed where there was like a fisherman and Jason went up and pulled the guy down. I think that was filmed, but that was deleted. But, uh, yeah. I mean, part six, you had Jason under the, in the water, but he opens his eye let people know he's still alive down there part five the the ending which then led to nothing even Corey Feldman like look at when he's hugging his sister like oh is he going to be a killer now he's going to be psycho now they didn't have any of that with it which I liked it was just a simple it, it's over and yeah I didn't talk about the music Fred Mullen did the it's the first Friday 13th film that they used Harry Manfredini's store, but it was also a Fred Mullen, who then would do part eight. I think Harry Manfredini was just busy with other stuff, but busy with other projects. So, there you go. But you're sure Harry Manfredini's like, well, what more can I do? I've done enough. But with that said, Yeah, I, I still like this film. It does have its issues, I know, but I do like it. 
especially the uncut version that I watch. <laughs> so yeah, I still like the film. I still have fun with the movie. It was still nice to, to watch this again. And thanks to Sean for the request. Uh, I really appreciate it. Next we'll go into Part A, Jason Taste Manhattan, which is the worst sequel I've seen. Far from it. Do I like the film? No. <laughs> but uh, we'll get to that later on. With that said, thanks. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye for now.